So yesterday, inshallah, we spoke about the importance of or the greatness of the responsibility of the trust that a believer holds and how one needs to live their life, making this their priority and their foundational uh, principle in their life. Everything that we do needs to be revolved around the deen. Habibman also mentioned about how on account of the greatness of this responsibility, a person will even change their own paradigms of understanding and their own ways of ways of life. We gave the example also about, for example, Fajr Salah. If we are more keen to wake our children up for school than waking them up for Fajr Salah, it means our priorities are Right? And likewise, anything else with regards to the things we know that hold weight in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they say some of the greatest sins in this world or the greatest sins that a person can commit is to give ta'zeem to something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tahqiq. To give reverence, right? And uh, or to something which in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has, uh, has made this thing despicable in his eyes. And the entire dunya and whatever it contains does not even weigh the weight of a mosquito in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today's lessons, Habibullah is going to be speaking. These are shorter paragraphs, inshallah. He's going to be speaking about the meaning of taklif and the meaning of accountability. What does it mean that one is accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or one submits oneself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ma'ana taklif, qala rallah ta'ala anhu, ma'ana taklif, ibtila allahu wa khtibaruhu laka. And so the meaning of accountability, for example, when a person, when a young boy or girl reaches the age of puberty, then we see that they have now become mukallaf. Taklif means, it comes from the word, kalifa means to put a responsibility on someone's shoulders or for someone to carry something. Right? If uh, you visit someone and you say, I don't, want, I don't want to cause any taklif for you. I don't want to cause any trouble for you. Right? It's a responsibility. It's, you, someone visits you, you now have a responsibility to take care of them. So the taklif is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing you right, and putting you to trial by having given you the choice. So this ability that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given human beings and jinn, that they can choose right or they can choose wrong, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أن تسخر هذا الاختيار على منهج so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the ability to choose, right? And then he requests from you that you take this choice and you only choose that in which he has taught you lies his, his good pleasure, all right? And this is means if a person is able to do that, then they have, they have passed the test. And the whole test for a human being is because when they think that they have the choice, then they think they can do whatever they want. And the whole purpose of the test is to say, you have the choice, but let's see what you want to do with it. So for example, it's almost like giving <clears throat> a child some money, right? And you give him the choice, but you then request him to spend all that money on a certain charitable course, right? Will this child do it or not? And in your mind, you know that if he spends it in the charitable course, you'll probably give him more than that. And whatever he wanted to buy for himself, in terms of his personal needs, you take care of all of that. But you didn't tell him that. You wanted to see whether he has this is Islam and whether he has your, uh, your good pleasure in mind. And this is the whole thing about taklif. Many times our minds tell us that this is difficult. And so we don't do certain things that Allah 
desires from us or we don't put our choice and our life actually becomes difficult because the whole test is just to see whether you do it or not. And then if you do Allah, take care of all the other needs, even more than you could have for yourself. So if Allah SWT has given you a choice and you have now the power to do or not to do, so you are in a position in which you can do something and not do something. Right? You have a choice of doing one of two things. The khitab, Allah SWT has direct uh, object or direct uh, direction to you. Right? The tawji is his. He's guiding you or he's requesting from you or asking you or commanding you to do a particular thing. So you can do or you don't have to do. Allah is now saying, okay, do this. Right? فَكَأَنَّ التَّكْلِيفِ عِبَارَةٌ عَنْ هَذَا الْخِطَابِ الْمُوَجَّهِ مِنَ الرَّبِّ الْمُبَلَّغِ عَلَىٰ أَيْدِ الرُّسُلِ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْهِمْ لِهَذَا النَّوْعِ مِنَ الْمَخْلُقَاتِ أَنْ إِفْعَلْ كَذَا Right? So it is as if the entire expression of taklif or the responsibility and accountability is this direction from the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which he conveyed to the prophets and then finally the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that do this and don't do this. So when we have a certain thing in the deen and we know that there is a shari'i ruling, meaning do this or don't do this, it is almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, oh my servant so and so, I want you to do this. So many people when they think of the sharia, oh, the sharia says you should do this. And some people say, oh no, no, the mulana said you must, you must do this. It's not the sharia and it's not the mulana, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, right? Therefore, even when a person is to read salah, when the time of Salah comes in, the time of Dhuhr, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. The speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a beginning and an end. So if Allah has commanded you to read Salah, then it is as if Allah is commanding you at every single instant to, to read Salah. So the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why would they rush to read Salah the first time? Is because as soon as Dhuhr Salah times come in, they realize that there is now a khitab, there is now a command, there is now a request, there is now a, a divine uh, imperative upon me. And Allah is saying, perform your Dhuhr Salah, perform your Dhuhr Salah, perform your Dhuhr Salah, right? This is in their mind. So you rush to implement the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can think about it. If you had a servant and you tell him, please clean, or you tell him, wash the car. It's the hard time, you tell him, oh, so and so, please, if you don't mind, wash the car. And five minutes later, you say, oh, so please wash the car. So, and all the way till Asr, and then five minutes before Asr, he goes and he washes the car. He's done the job. But what's your opinion of him? And what's your opinion of when, as soon as you said, wash the car, he goes and he immediately washes the car. And what about that servant who, even before you ask, know what you want, and he goes and does it before you can anyway, right? And then Imam Ghazali gives this example. He says many times when you want to, if you want to understand this paradigm of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, put yourself in that position of a master and a, and a slave or a father and a child. And if you had to request these duties from someone lower than you and they don't do it, right, or they do it, how would you feel? And you can engage your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. So this taklif is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, uh, direction to human beings or to uh, his creation whom he has given this choice to say you have the choice but use it in the way in which I have commanded you and so if a person makes his will subservient to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and where he knows the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lies and he does not use his will except in that which Allah has allowed him to then he has now passed he has passed the test and he has fulfilled the duties now of his accountability and so now he deserves and is worthy of being raised into the circles of of being honored the whole purpose the purpose was not to put you in difficulty but Allah wants to honor Allah created paradise and hell and he said each will have their fair share. Right? And Allah also created spiritual stations in proximity with him and he wants to raise people to these stations. Right? And so the whole purpose is to see who will who will have what stations. 
And then this person will attain the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the, the most gentle and the most generous. As we said, you wanted to test that child if he's going to use that money for this charitable cause because you know that even though that amount of money you gave him is nothing in comparison with what you will give him if he listened to you, right? And not just the money, but if that child uses and he fulfills the command of his father, he's won the heart of his father. What won't you then, or what needs won't you then see to the to that child now? What needs of the child won't you see to? And if a person attains this honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he passes this test, Allah has promised him, Allah has promised him generosity and goodness. And honor which even the minds of all created things cannot fathom. Because when Allah is the most generous. And if Allah decides to be generous to you, can you fathom the extent of his generosity? Of course not. Min anwa' al al khaliq subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor this person with types of honor which even the intellects of human beings cannot even fathom. وَإِن لَمْ يُقُمْ بِحَقِّ التَّكْلِيفِ However, if this person does not fulfill the rights of this taklif and accountability, كَانَ حَقًّا عَلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يَنْقُلَهُ إِلَى دَائِرُتِ ذِلَّةِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause this person to fall into the abyss of, of humiliation. وَالْمَهَانَ بِمَا يُسَلِّطُهُ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ التَّعْذِيبِ وَالْتَعْنِيفِ وَالشَّدَائِ وَالْأَهْوَالِ الَّتِي هِيَ أَيْضًا لَا and subservience to other things, and Allah SWT then will, has promised him punishment, reprimanding, right, in all types of difficulties, of which obviously a human being cannot, cannot pay. If a person cannot fathom the generosity of Allah SWT, then can they also fathom the, the anger and the punishment of Allah SWT. وَلَا تُحِيدُ بِهَا الْأُقُولِ مِنَ الْهَوْلِ الْمَهُولِ الَّذِي يَحْسُونَ مِنَ الرَّبِّ الْجَبَّارِ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ لِلْمُعْرِضِينَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ And through these punishments, this humiliation and the uh, reprimanding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, also has types which the human mind cannot, cannot understand. And this is the test of life. There's no other secret out there which people are going to, going to find out. And even if they go to Mars and whatever, and they go beyond stellar space, whatever, they're not going to find anything which the Prophet did not bring us. There's no secret out there that needs to be found out. Everything the Prophet ﷺ has, has explained. And the only secrets revolve around the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the secrets that people need to be need to be seeking. In the spiritual states, the greatest forms of spiritual openings concern the asma and the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowledge of the qualities and the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And likewise, the unique character of the Prophet ﷺ, or the unique uh, nature of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the greatest openings that a person can attain. If a person gets knowledge about what's on another planet or what's in other parts of space, how does that benefit you? Because these are also created things. And a person who is sincere about getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not want to involve himself with created things because he wants to get to the to the creator. وقال رضي الله تعالى عنه ونفعنا به يا أيها الذين آمنوا ما لكم إذا قيل لكم انفروا في سبيل الله استقلتم إلى الأرض. Okay, this chapter now is about the danger of being lazy and the danger of falling behind in doing service to this رسالة, the message of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Allah سبحانه وتعالى in the Quran says, "O you who believe, what is the matter with you? ما لكم?" إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ مُنْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ When it is said to you that now go forth in the path of Allah, and this verse specifically refers to jihad, right? But in, 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 in context, any form of khidma for the deen, right? يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ أَمْنُوا مَا لَكُمْ إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ مُنْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِذَّا قَلْتُمْ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ That you, are now, you now cling heavily to the earth, right? The verse then goes on, أَرَضِيتُ بِالْحَيَاتِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ are you pleased with the life of this world over the hereafter? Right? And what is the purpose of jihad? A person will go and give their life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you think that your life is important, but Allah has taught us that your life in this world is just temporary and he wants to give you eternal life. So all you who believe what is the matter with you that when it is said go forth in the path of Allah, you cling heavily to the earth. 
اذا وجه الخطاب للرعيل الاول فالاولى لنا ان نتفكر في المرسيس that if this was the direct or the direction or the خطاب the speech that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to that first generation of sahaba then we need to ponder over it even even more قال تعالى الا تنفروا يعذبكم عذابا اليما ويستبدل قوما غيركم فذا ان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال انت الاس الا تنفروا if you do not go forth and this is very important people don't realize when we said we are not we have not been created to eat and sleep in and drink it just live our lives and go to work and come we have a mission and we have a job to do we have a job prescription from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illa tanfiru if you do not go forth meaning if you do not do this duty if you do not carry on this responsibility right what will happen yu'adhibkum adaban alima he will indeed punish you with a severe severe punishment in this particular case obviously going out in jihad and if the call for jihad is made by the khalifa or in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a person did not go out this is almost a form of a form of disbelief right and also the, the the punishment for a person who renegades from the battlefield if you are in a battle and you turn your back to the enemy and you run away this person will uh, this person will will be punished and they will not be forgiven what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? إِلَّا تَنْفِرُوا يُعَذِّبُكُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا If you do not go forth, you do not fulfill the responsibility, Allah will indeed punish you with a severe torment. وَيَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ And He will substitute you with people other than you. Meaning Allah is going to do the job of preserving the deen and propagating the deen and He's honored you by choosing. You don't do it, no problem. You get someone else to, to do it for you. وَهَلْ تَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ عَذَابِهِ الْأَلِيمِ Do we as human beings, can we bear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَيَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ يَنْصُرُونَهُ Allah will then choose and substitute you with other people who will help his deen and will fulfill the purpose of his deen. وَلَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْ مَتَلَائِمِ And they will not be fearful. They will not be afraid of what people are going to say. They will not be shy. They will not have apprehensions about my family and this and that and culture and place and whatever. We have a duty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will fulfill that duty, right? And we see how the people of batil, of falsehood, how they defend falsehood, right? And they will use all the means available to them to propagate this falsehood. And who and we who are, or at least we claim to have the truth, what is the extent that we actually are fulfilling this, fulfilling this duty? And we know the other verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayu ladina amanu. May يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ جِينِهِ Oh, you who believe those, whoever of you turn away from his religion, so فَيَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقْوَمِ Then Allah will soon come with the people who love him and he loves them. يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ Right? After that. يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَا يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ جِينِهِ فَسَوْ فَيَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقْوَمِ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْمَ تَلَعِمُ They then will fulfill the duty. They will fight in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are not afraid of the, the Arabic is the blame of the blameless meaning any sort of obstacles apprehensions, fears, shyness as well. Yesterday we spoke about how one of the greatest obstacles in the life of a Muslim is what? Is shyness. And there's a good shyness and there's also a, a bad shyness. Right? A student of knowledge who is shy will never learn. And likewise a person who wants to do da'wah but he is shy you can never do you know, if you are shy to go and speak, you see a person, you see a person wanting to, you're sitting in a masjid or in a certain place and you see someone come in and you can see that they are non-Muslim, right? And they're looking around for someone to help them, right? And you're shy to go speak to them. And so improving one's social skills is part of the responsibilities of the hour, how to make conversation with people, right? One of our brothers who accepted Islam, and then he came to Tareem, and he said, he says, he was speaking about a specific uh, type of Muslims or ethnicity of Muslims, right? And he says, they have absolutely no social skills. He says, they don't know how to engage in conversation with, not even non-Muslims, with other people. He goes to a certain city because he wanted to accept Islam, and everyone that he met and saw didn't even greet him, Right? When they saw him in the shops, they just looked away and walked for two whole weeks. He says, until, until a Turkish brother saw him, and obviously you can see by 
the nature of his ethnicity that he wasn't from the place. Oh, how, how are you? What are you doing? Where you come from? And he said, after two weeks of waiting for someone to come to him, right, a Turkish brother comes. But the entire city is a different, a different ethnicity. So improving our social skills for the sake of Dawah is a responsibility on our shoulders. And we need to also be able to train our children. Everything happens in a the balance. There's no ifrat and there's no tafrit, right? So social skills in terms of being able to engage the other party for the sake of Dawah. Right? And sometimes it might require, for example, a non-Muslim is not held to the standards of the, the gender interactions. So, for example, even if you as a male have to interact with a female and she comes to the masjid and this has happened. When was it two weeks ago? You go to the Turkish masjid in, in Madrid and a woman walks in. She wants to accept Islam. But if you're like, oh, she's not dressed appropriately. I can't speak to her. Right? This is, this is sincere misguidance. Right? And even, we can't even call it sincere because this person hasn't understood that responsibilities. And so there is a decorum and an etiquette within which you have to engage with a certain person, right? When a person then understands the nature of interaction, what Islam requires between between brothers and sisters, then obviously there can be a different form of interaction. And this balance is always required, knowing what to do at the at that particular instance and a particular time. وَيَسْتَدْلِ قَوْمٍ غَيْرَكُمْ وَلَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْمَ تَعِيمٍ اِذْهَبْ نَمْ وَسَيَأْتِيَ رِجَالٌ يَأْخُذُونَ الصُّفُوفِ وَيَتْلَعُونَ إِلَى فَوْقِ Habib Mursi said, go and sleep. Go and sleep. Allah SWT will bring the men. Right? And men, when we, in, 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 the, in the terminology of the deen and the terminology of the people of Allah, they refer to رِجَال, رِجَالُ اللَّهِ But there are many women who are رِجَالُ اللَّهِ and there are many men who are not رِجَالُ اللَّهِ رِجَالُ اللَّهِ here means the men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is used as a description of people that have certain qualities, not necessarily men in the sense of biological, biological nature. And like we said, we are not uh, we are not bound by these uh, convoluted ideas that we have to you know worry about our what we see in the deen if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to uh la buyutin alina Allahu. And turfa'a. We have got the Esmu, you said before. Rijanu la tulhihim. Men whom neither trade, tijarotun, uh, trade and merchandise does not distract them from Allah SWT. Allah is using the term rijal. But does this refer to men only? No, it refers to people that have that quality of rujula. Right? Meaning they have those qualities which Allah SWT, which Allah SWT loves and which is kaman. And there are many women that, like I said, have more of these qualities than. Than, than men. And so how are you saying? Go and sleep and Allah will bring those people and they'll take the safs. They will take the rose. Those, those safs that will be on the day of Qiyamah with the Prophet ﷺ, they are available. The spots are available, right? So it is almost like an invitation. Listen, we have the first saf on the day of Qiyamah. Who wants to take the first saf? We have the second, third, fourth, fifth. And then we have the safs at the back. Are you up for it? Take it. You don't have to we'll bring someone else to, to take those steps, right? And they will achieve these great spiritual stations because in every generation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to the people that serve the deen, the spiritual stations of those people who will be raised up in the first self. So many times the Yawm Shaykh saying that in every generation, they are sabiqun. Sabiqun, sabiqun, ulaika, nukarabun. Right? Thullatu minal awalina wa qalilun minal akhirin. And the Prophet also described these types of people to the Sahaba in the end of times. He said, their reward would be as 50 of you. And the Sahaba says, why will they be 50? The Prophet also said, because you find help and it's easy for you to practice them, but they won't act. So you can actually have that station, right? And in every generation until the day of Qiyamah, there will be a set amount of people who will get this this highest level and then after them and then after them. And the choice is just how keen and with what determination does a perfect person take on this responsibility to fulfill the duties of living by the deen and propagating it. If you waste these opportunities and you waste the chance to raise yourselves to these high stations, you are then going to fall into into an abyss, mashaqib, things that distract you. So imagine, you have the choice of getting somewhere very, very high. If you don't use it, what's going to happen? Unless you get, 
you get used for something else. The nature of a human being is to serve. Right? The nature of a human being is to worship. Allah SWT has created a human being that he needs to worship. Right? He has an attraction to perfection. He wants to follow. He wants, And so if you don't worship Allah SWT, you'll end up worshipping your intellect or other people. There's no even the atheists. Let's say they don't believe. What do what, what is their Lord? Their Lord is their own, their own hawa, right? Even people that say, okay, we don't follow this particular school of thought, whatever. Then who do they follow? They follow this, whether it's an orientalist or who gave them their ideas. No person is independent of worship. You are worshiping whether you like it or not. Right? You have to ask yourself, what are you? What are you worshiping? Allah will then. Bring other people if you if you don't take these opportunities. Wahum ahlunusratihi, these are the people who will give victory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wahum ahlunadratihi, and they are the ones upon whom will fall the divine gazes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wahum ahlu rahmatihi, and they are those who will achieve and receive the greatest portion of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wahum ahlu takrimihi wa ifbal. They are the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shower with generosity, gifts, and virtues. So all those who lag behind, they are only doing themselves a disservice. All right? Because indeed, the victory for the religion doesn't come from you and I or anyone else. It comes from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكِنْ إِنْ نَصَرَ إِنْ نَصَرْتُمُوهُ فَسَيُسَمِّيكُمْ أَنْصَرًا But the reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down the carpet of honor for you to walk on it. So if you assist Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he is the one who will bring victory to the religion, look at how generous Allah is. He now calls you, for you send me and he will call you the helpers of the helpers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Naqumu bin Nusrati, inshaAllah, he was then saying, we will all fulfill our duty in this, helping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the deen, inshaAllah. Wa illa nakunu makaratan wal iyadu billah. And if we don't do this, then we will fall into deception. And we ask Allah SWT for protection. Okay, if a person has opportunities to serve the deen and they don't do this, they'll end up serving their own hawa or their own desires. Yeah, they'll end up serving human beings in a different way. Right? The opportunities that come when it comes to the deen, you know, you have we have competitions, right? How many winners are there usually in a competition? There are a few. Right? You have corporate positions, you know, then according to how this one gets to a higher position in the company, right? And if you miss those opportunities, how many times or how often will you get that opportunity again? You might or might not, right? And this deen and these positions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the greatest or is the greatest competition that ever existed, right? And who knows when you miss an opportunity whether it will ever come back again. And you've heard sometimes from the tongues of our mashayikh that many people Right? They would have had the opportunity to reach the pinnacle of the height of spiritual stations and that in their lifetime, but because they slept, they'll never ever reach that again ever in their whole life. And whether they realize it or not also is, is another story. Yeah. Sure. Uh, in modern society where like this understanding of your responsibility, think about it in a modern way, they say every Muslim is a boy, every person is understood the responsibility and then was working towards this goal of that working. How would other things in society happen? Like if I think of a simple example, how would people get going to business? How would people how would society be if everyone is just thinking that that's all your level consumption? So the question is if everyone was fulfilling the needs of Dawa, how would society operate? First and foremost we need to realize that Dawa is not a specific pattern of you have to go and talk and open up a madrasa and institute. You're going to work and business is dawa. Right? If you for the Prophet even spoke about this, a person who goes to work to earn a halal risk for his family, he is in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But how do you do your business? If you in your business, you don't deceive anyone, you speak amicably, you represent the Prophet in your character, you are doing dawa. From the moment you leave your house to the time you come back, and then even in your house, when you enter your house and you have this response, the thing is to carry the hum, to carry the response, the, the 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 responsibility and the worry of this responsibility that you have. That is the dawah. But the dawah is so great that if every single 
Muslim on the face of the earth had to spend 100% of the efforts, it still would not fulfill the needs of the da'wah. The only person that is able to give the haqq of da'wah is who? Is the Prophet ﷺ himself. And so any organization or any person that claims that we are doing, we are giving the haqq of da'wah, then they are deluded. And we also need to realize that all of our different groups and organizations, we are only fulfilling a part of the da'wah. Because it is impossible for us to do the job that the Prophet ﷺ himself, he was the only one that could give da'wah its haqq. And if we realize this, and we say we are doing the da'wah in a way that we are able to, but we realize we are fulfilling a portion of the da'wah, you will then work amicably with other groups because they are also fulfilling only a portion. And even if every single human being on the face of the earth did the da'wah, there would still be more opportunity for someone else. Meaning, we look for the good in what other people are doing. Habib Umar said, if we see a different organization, a person, they are doing a hundred wrong things, and they are doing one right thing, in that one right thing we will we will support them, and we will advise them with regards to that. But now we have people doing a hundred right things, and they do one wrong thing, what do we do? We cancel them out, right? Because we think we can actually do the da'wah. Habib Umar says, many times people, because they don't have this understanding of the deen, right? One person will be in a certain organization or group, right? And their leaders or he himself might see the Prophet ﷺ encouraging him, right, to do this and guiding him how to do the da'wah in his particular group or organization. And because he sees the Prophet ﷺ in his dream, he thinks, MashaAllah, we are the saved sect. We are the ones who are on the haqq. You know, I, I, my teacher, I saw the Prophet ﷺ. Not realizing that another group in another organization, in another sect that they actually think are at lockerheads with them, also sees the Prophet ﷺ and guiding them and telling them to do different things. Right, because it is all the ummah of the Prophet. And we need to realize that we ourselves cannot fulfill that responsibility. And so it's not about numbers, it is not about trying to win people. No one will ever be in this entire uh, existence of ours from after the death of the Khulafa Rashidin. No one will ever be on the same, the same manhaj. Right? Until the time that Imam Mahdi, Imam Mahdi comes. The entire ummah is going to differ in the way the methodologies, right? And the differences of opinion that even within certain aspects of aqidah and certain aspects of fiqh, right, and spirituality that people have. But how do you fulfill this goal realizing that we are doing it to save ourselves? Only. We're not doing it because we want to save people, but first and foremost, we want to save ourselves and give that opportunity for other people to also realize that they are on haqq and they are also fulfilling that responsibility. Even in the spiritual path, right, this expensiveness of uh, or your horizons or knowing that you know what the dean is greater than me in my organization right or my even my own understanding and this is a very humble uh, process if you can understand that the dean and the dawah is greater than even what you can understand then you won't judge people right the problems happen is because we want to judge people they are not fulfilling things according to our standards who are who are we in the first place and what type of understanding can we claim to have of encompassing the deen in that we can say this one is right and this one is wrong in the methodologies that they're using obviously we're not talking about halal halal and haram here, right and so a person who has this expensiveness they can understand in the spiritual path right they would tell people i mean you, you do it sometimes that you should believe that your sheikh is is the highest for example in a spiritual level in in this particular age because if you don't believe that then you should go <laughs> be seeking another sheikh right it's fine to believe that about your sheikh, but give the right to other people who have their own mashayikh to also believe in that. right? And people who don't understand it and they're narrow-minded, what ends up happening? They try wanting to convince other people why my sheikh or my teacher is greater than, than your sheikh and your teacher. No. Right? We don't want to win people over. We need to find the methodologies and the tools that allow us to live our life fulfilling our responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that not everyone is going to come on to the same path. And there are people that might be within your own ranks today. Tomorrow they'll find a different methodology that works for them. And that's fine. Because where's the goal? The goal is also to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. And we mentioned yesterday as well that this concept of da'wah only being going and talking and lecturing is a very narrow concept. And in the West, the ulama have less opportunity for da'wah than the then the common, the common people that are working because their interaction with, especially with regards to non-Muslims, is more than 
more than the ulama, right? I'll give you an example of da'wah, right? They mentioned this in the books of one of the Sufi sheikhs. He says he's in the souq, right? And he is looking for something to buy. And he sees a young boy selling on the side of the road. And he goes, and as he's buying, he takes a few things, and then the adhan is given, right? As soon as the adhan is given, he says this boy starts closing up, covering his things, and he's going. He says, no, I still want to complete. He says, what you bought, I'll take money from you. What you still want to buy, take it for free. It's salat time, I need to go for salat, right? Is it da'wah, is it not da'wah? Right? In your work at the time of salah, you just take leaf and you go and you pray. That is da'wah to people. When you're eating and you go to family, right? It's time to eat. People haven't uh, yet washed their hands. Is there a place I can wash my hands? That is da'wah. And the da'wah is the hal more than the more than the aqwal, right? It is the state that you carry in your heart and the concern that you have in your heart more than the words that you are that you are actually saying. Ibn then goes on, speak wa qala radiyallahu ta'ala anhu wa nafa'an bi ahwalun ibtala'ati al-muslimin insha'allahu yukhallisuhum allahu minha. This chapter, Ibn is going to be explaining about how the call of the prophets and what the Prophet ﷺ, what the prophets, Allah SWT sent them to call to was actually a revival of that original covenant that Allah SWT took from from all human beings in jinn, in the alam, in the world of souls. So when Allah SWT created the souls, He took the covenant from them, Alam ahdi shaitan, and the covenant, alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And we all replied, bala. And then obviously people were sent to the world, and the role of the prophets was to remind people about that covenant that you already took with Allah SWT. Are you going to fulfill that covenant or not? So Habibun is saying that we see these difficult conditions that have come upon the Ummah and the Muslims and he makes dua that Allah SWT free and lift these conditions off from the believers. فَنَادَ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Habib Umar then uh, recites the verse of the Quran about uh, the noon, Yunus alayhi salam, that he called out in the darkness when he was swallowed by the whale, أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ that there is none Worthy of worship besides you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa glory be to you, in your kuntum in al I have indeed been of the wrongdoers. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمَ Allah then says, we answered his prayer and we saved him from the grief that he was in. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ mu'minin. And likewise, we will save the believers. That is why in times of calamity, one of the prescriptions is this dua. يَا حَيُّ يَقِيُمْ لَا إِلَهِ لَا تَسَبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ because if Allah SWT saved Yusuf, uh, Yunus alayhi salam and he said likewise we will save the believers then if we repeat the same dua by the text of the Quran our hope is that Allah SWT will, will then save us. Allah is with me, Allah is with us. Upon him is our trust and our reliance. When Isa salam said to his disciples who is there that will be my helpers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or help me in assisting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you say talking, assisting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean fulfilling the duty of conveying the deen. The help is coming from Allah whether you are there or not but Allah gives you the honor of calling you his helper if you respond to the call. The disciples answered, we are the helpers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there was a party from the Bani Israel who believed and a party who disbelieved and then we assisted and helped those who believed. We helped them against their enemies. And then they became the manifest party and they were given, they were given victory. And if, the, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that to the Bani Israel, then it is even more worthy that Allah will give this honor to whom? To the Ummah of the Prophet. Because of what Allah SWT has ordained and decreed and chosen, right, out of generosity of for this 
ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we all know the virtues of the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. والخلاصة أن دعوات الأنبياء ورسل هؤلاء التي توجهت للعباد the what they call the upshot or the خلاصة in summary the call of the prophets and the messengers all of them and all that they did in calling people towards Allah سبحانه وتعالى عبارة عن عقود وعهود بين الواحد المعبود ومن يستجيب من عباده لذلك ويدركه it is all an expression of the covenants that exist between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those people who then respond to the call and those who understand it. Right? A revival of that, of that original covenant. Okay, so you imagine you have a company, you're running the company, the owner passes away, right? And there were many workers, and after many, many years, this company goes into uh it, it's not it's not even working anymore. And the people in that society now they forget about this company. Right, and their children, and their children's children. And then you come after, or there's someone that comes after many generations, and he pulls out all the archives and he starts telling people, you know what, your grandfather or your father or your great grandfather used to, used to run this particular company, and he started it from scratch. And, 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 and. and now this person realizes that, hey, you know what, there is something like this. And I remember my father used to talk to me about something. It's something that that generation don't understand it or don't realize it, right? But when they are reminded about it, then they understand that, hey, you know what? We in this community, we used to actually run this company, right? And there was benefits for the society. And so someone who now understands, what will he do? He'll go back to one, two, start and revive things. And this is a summary. And walillahi al ala, right? We just use these as examples. And so a person who responds to the call of the prophets, he is someone who now realizes what was the original covenant that he took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ اخْتَلَفَتْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ أَحْوَالُ الْمُسْتَجِبِينَ لِلْدَعْوَى And then people's abilities and the states that they have in responding to this call differ. فَمِنْهُمْ أَنْ شَهِدَ شَهَادَةَ الْحَقِّ وَاكْتَفَى بِالْعَمَلِ بِهَا فِي خَاصَةِ نَفْسِهِ وَلَمْ يَنْتَحِدْ Right, there are some who accepted the call, they professed belief, right, in Islam. وَاكْتَفَى بِالْعَمَلِ بِهَا فِي خَاصَةِ نَفْسِهِ But he is happy just to suffice with doing deeds specific to himself. Meaning he does the basics that he is required to do. وَلَمْ يَنْتَهِلْ But he doesn't get up and do the bigger responsibilities. So there are responsibilities with regards to yourself and there are responsibilities with regards to society and other people, right? So one person is just worried about himself and he doesn't he doesn't rise up. وَكَانَ مِنَ الْقَاعِدِينَ This person is regarded as what? مِنَ الْقَاعِدِينَ Those that sit at home. Right? If you can think of, I mean, Habib will explain it. When the call was made for jihad, right? So the society was there. They were all reading Salah. They were all doing the Zakah. They were all... But now the call is made to go out, to take the responsibility. Right? So there are those who respond and then there are those who abide and they stay at home. Right? Uh, what do we call them? They say armchair critics. <laughs> right? They just sit at home, but they can. Right? No. فكان من القائدين ومنهم من علم أن مقتضاها ما يجعله عاشقا للبذل في سبيل رب. But then there are others who realize that the deen necessitates, right, that which makes him love spending from his health and his wealth and his persons and everything dear to him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Right? There are those who are just doing their duties by the way, and there are those who know that I need to spend my soul for the sake of this team. And they are willing to spend their soul for the sake of this team and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The greatest form of tadhiyah, the greatest form of sacrifice is what? To sacrifice oneself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are all sacrificing our time. But we are sacrificing our time for who? For our jobs, for our families, for our children. We are all sacrificing our wealth. But we are sacrificing our wealth for what? For our own consumerist lifestyles. We are all sacrificing our health. But we are sacrificing it for who? For status. Because we want to, want to be seen as, you know, macho or healthy. This sort of thing. Everyone is sacrificing their health, their wealth, right? And their time. But for who are you sacrificing? Now. وَعَاشِقًا لِأَنْوَاءِ التَّضْحِيَاتِ فَكَانَ مُسَابِقًا وَمُسَادِعًا لِلسُّفُورِ Right, there are those who realize that this deen necessitates that one begins to yearn and love to spend the entire existence for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And they 
are willing to do that to sacrifice any and all types of sacrifices that is required. Right? فَكَانَ مُسَابِقُنُ مُسَارِعَنِ الصُّفُوفِ And this is the person who is now vying and he is racing to to get to those front subs, those front rows. قَالَ تَعَالَى فِي الْفَرِيقَيْنِ Allah SWT said about these two groups لَا يَسْتَوِي الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ غَيْرُ أُولِ الضَّرَارِ Never will the two groups be equal. Who? Those who are sitting at home. They are believers غَيْرُ قَاعِدِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَا يَسْتَوِي الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Those believers, Allah calls them believers, but they are sitting at home غَيْرِ أُولِ الضَّرَارِ They don't have an excuse. Besides those who have an excuse, a person was crippled or he was blind or he has an excuse in which he is not able to go out. They will never be equal to those who go out. فَلَمْ يُخْرِجْهُمْ مِنْ قَاعِدَةِ الْإِيمَانِ Allah SWT did not take them out of the circle of faith. Allah is saying they are believers, right? وَلَكِنَّهُمْ مَسْتَوَوْ مَعَ الصَّنْ فِي الْآخِرِ But they are never مَعَ الصَّنْ فِي الْآخِرِ However, Allah SWT does, does not equate them to the other group. لَا يَسْتَوِي الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرِ وَالْمُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ Those that sit at home from amongst the believers, unless they have an excuse, are never and will never be equal to the mujahideen in the path of Allah. They are mujahideen what? Allah SWT doesn't just say mujahideen فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They are striving in the path of Allah. They are striving with what? بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ Right? They are spending from their wealth and from themselves for the sake of Allah SWT. Right? And where a person spends his wealth, you can tell how keen they are in fulfilling the responsibilities of, of the deen. And therefore many times the people of Allah SWT, if we see that they have institutes or they have madaris, many times they would have spent from their own wealth. They would have gone into poverty, but they understood the importance of the dawah and so they established these these institutes or these places with their own wealth, right? An example, Mataha Khan, he's known in, in Cape Town for his madrasa and obviously he was a genius. And the students of knowledge know that his library had a very special, Brother Anwar was there as well, right? His library, how did he start his library? His own personal collection, he came and he put it in the, in the madrasa. And a person, a scholar, it's very difficult for him to part with his books. Right? And the scholars sometimes they say it is even for Muslim people not to borrow books because when you borrow a book, you sometimes never get it back. Right? And they, 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 they capitalize their books. Right? But he took his own personal collection and then he made it a work for all the, not just for the students of the madrasa, he made it a work for the ummah. Right? And it was the only madrasa or very, very, the only library that was open 24 7. He used to say a library that is not open 24 hours a day is not going to produce students. Right? If anyone could come from outside, the doors of the madrasa were open 24 hours a day. Anyone could come to the library and, and read from there. And you see how Allah SWT allowed it to, to grow. Right? And so they spend their wealth in the path of Allah SWT. فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنْفُسِهِمْ عَلَى الْقَاعِدِينَ دَرَجَةً Allah has indeed preferred those who strive in, their, in His path with their wealth and their persons عَلَى الْقَاعِدِينَ دَرَجَةً Allah has preferred them over those who sit at home, preferred them in stages, great, great, great stages. Allah has promised for all of them that they will get the reward, right? They are all believers, Allah has promised that they will all get the reward. Allah then repeats, but Allah has preferred the mujahideen, those who strive in his path, over those who sit at home, a great, 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 great reward. Allah has preferred them with a great reward over the others. I mean, Allah says a great reward. Again, our minds cannot fathom, right? Darajatin minhu wa maghfiratan wa rahmatullah then drives on the point. Darajatin minhu, stages. Allah has preferred them in stages over wa maghfiratan wa rahmah in types of forgiveness and mercy, right? Wa kana Allah ghafur rahimah Allah, in Allah is indeed oft forgiving, most merciful. If a person is not involved in any aspect physically in supporting the deen, and this is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you cannot do the job of the da'wah, then support the da'wah. If a person cannot become a hafiz, right, or your own children cannot become a hafiz, support a child that's becoming a hafiz, pay his fees, and you get the reward for his fifth and for the rest of his life in all the Quran. The true traders, the true ones who are doing real business are those who know how to use their wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
You want to become an alim, but you can't do it. You want to become a scholar? Go and support a scholar. And you get the reward for all of his da'wah and everything that he does. Right? Support a madrasa, support an institution. And in this regard, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they realize that I should have a hand in all the different types of khair that exist in society. I should be supporting the masajid. I should be supporting orphanages. I should be supporting the widows. They look at all the different types. Why? Because they want that reward. All of those things, whether I'm doing it or I'm not doing it, right? And we need to look at ourselves. Where is our wealth going? What are we What are we doing with our wealth? And the, again, the consumerist lifestyle is all about just accumulating and using it for our own things. I need another phone, so that money goes into, right? But your local imam who might, you know, he's in need, he doesn't even have a, a proper phone. But no one will ever think of, you know what, let's get him a nice phone who thinks he can do his or a car, or anything, for example. The paradigm of how we deal with wealth in relation to the responsibilities of da'wah is completely cocaine. We are only thinking about ourselves, right? And if we are not, we don't need, and one of the greatest obstacles is people, okay, you know what, but you know what, this requires society and we need to gather. What can you do? You are responsible for your own money. And you start with what you can do. Find one person, find one institute, find, make istikharat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, where can I use my wealth in a way that will please you and will serve the purpose of the da'wah? Or I can help those who are doing the da'wah. I don't want to be left out of this great reward that you have promised for these mujahideen, these people who serve and give their lives and their health and their wealth for your sake. Right? And you make istikharat. And Allah will guide you to where to spend. And it doesn't necessarily, like it says, it doesn't have to even be the traditional way that people are, are used to. Part of the da'wah is even just upliftment of communities, upliftment of societies. Not necessarily in terms of spreading the deen, but people that, for example, you have in this particular country, we have domestic workers, right? How many of us actually pay attention to them and their children and perhaps their grandchildren and the societies that they come from or the homes that they come from and the needs that they have? Right, to uplift them, not just to give handouts, uplifting people as human beings. This is also the greatest form of the greatest form of da'wah. And we've got to break out of the shackles of what, how we think wealth ought to be spent for the sake of the deen and ask Allah to inspire us with new ways. Right? There are the traditional ways of the madaris, the masajid, right, and what the charity organizations are doing, but there are also needs in society. And any way in which you spend your wealth. And your intention has this hum and this concern for the deen, concern for pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that has the same waqa, it has the same effect as da'wah. And then also we must understand that when we spend in charity and when we spend, it is not just the money that you are giving. It has an effect. And we close with the story and we complete the chapter perhaps uh, in our next lesson, inshallah. A person, the Prophet gives a story about a person in a certain community he gave a large amount of wealth. And this also teaches us how, when we give, are we, is it about, oh no, but this organization is not, or this person is going to go do this and this is what it, right? Prophet Muhammad said, but it was a person gave and he wanted to uh, reach the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he gave a large amount of charity in a certain community. The next day, when people woke up, it was said that, oh, there was a large amount of charity given to a, to a thief. So he thought to himself, Ya Rab, did my, was my money not worthy of going to anyone else other than a thief? And so he goes the next day and he decides to give charity to someone where he thinks it will be worthy. And the next day people wake up and say, charity was given to a prostitute. <laughs> a large amount of charity was given to a prostitute. And he says, Ya Rab, what is my station with you? My money is not worth even going to anyone who is worthy of it. And then he goes and he gives charity a third time. And the people in the community, they start speaking. Last night, charity was given to a rich man. <laughs> and so he's thinking, Arab, my wealth, how do I spend it in your path? And he's very concerned. And due to the sincerity, see what happens. Because when we deal with money, right, and we give charity, it's not about whether you have sussed out the situation. It's about your intention. Give that money, and Allah, I intend to uplift the deen. You want to give money and you want to uplift the suffering of the people in Gaza, and this is what our teachers have told us. And this is how one deals with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to feed the people there, feed the people in your community. But make that intention, because that's your ability. Right? That's what you have. You don't have the power. Do what you can in your sphere of influence.
And then when he went to sleep the next day, he saw in a dream and he said, Allah has accepted your charity. The thief that you gave the charity to, its effect will be that that person will stop committing theft. The prostitute who the charity was given to on account of it, Allah will make her repent from her ways. And the rich person whom you gave the charity to, he is a miser, but on account of that charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will now make him one who also gives charity. Right? So outside, in the external realm for us, there was no benefit in that. But what was the intention of the one who gave? Allah makes things happen in the world. Right? And society can change with just the intentions of how we give our charity. Right? Whether it is your neighbor, your local uh, person that you know is in need, anyone else in the organizations that we have. Again, coming back to that, we are only dealing with whom, we are only dealing with Allah SWT. It's only about us and Allah SWT. And if you go further, it's even not even about us, it's about only Allah SWT. And how can we on be honored by Him, right? Because in the hereafter, that's when all the stages will become revealed. We ask Allah SWT to pray to fix.